This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry with agriculture broadcasters Orion Samuelson and Max Armstrong and featuring agriculture meteorologist Greg Solier. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH and your local Case IH dealer. Coming up here on this weekend's broadcast, that social media hashtag plant22 could be still planting22. Hello, everyone. We welcome you to our weekend visit here. Mr. Pearson is back at the desk. You did some traveling. I did. I had the chance to travel to Idaho to talk to the Idaho Bankers Association. And Max, I tell you, they're grappling with a lot of the same issues we're hearing from across the country. Wet and cold weather at planting time, slowing things down in that part of the world. I bet there was a little discussion there of interest rates. Yes, there was. A lot of talk about interest, a lot of concerns about inflation as we look to the future. Field work, of course, is always on the mind in the agriculture sector, and that's been the case across much of the Corn Belt. Our crew was out the other day west of Chicago, near Malta, Illinois, where Gene Reed was in the process of planting, getting a later start there. Usually we'd start like the 20th of April, didn't get started until into May this year, about two weeks later than normal, and uh, cold, wet soil to start, and then it finally warmed up a couple 90 degree days, and Everybody got rolling pretty good. There sure have been those wide temperature swings that many growers have experienced, and Gene pointed out that did make a difference in accessibility of the fields. With the warm conditions, 90 degree temperature, high humidity, uh, the corn normally will take seven to 10 days to emerge, was emerging this year in about five days. Gene Reed at Malta, Illinois, told our crew the other day that many of the farmers around him are done with the corn planting now. They would be moving on to planting soybeans there. Well, I tell you, Max, next door in the state of Iowa, farmers have been getting a good jump on corn, and it's expected on Monday that we'll see an even bigger jump due to the hot weather this past week. Some folks were able to get in and get some planting done. It'll be interesting to look at the weekly crop progress bulletins, not only about corn and soybeans, but cotton as well, and grain sorghum, spring and durum wheat, where it's been slow as well in some areas. Absolutely. They did get the fields in at the Farm Progress Show site at Boone, Iowa. Actually, that was a little more than a week ago they were out there in the those fields at Boone putting in the corn that will be harvested at the showtime coming up at the end of August. I think on one day they put in about 80 acres of corn altogether and the next day they put in another 240 acres. Good progress there in getting those fields planted at the 2022 Farm Progress Show site. Now that's at Boone. We were in that area not too many days ago at Nevada, Iowa, in our Plan Smart, Grow Smart series. We visited Longview Farm and uh, talked with the farmers there. Well, we were visiting a little bit about not just the crops, but how they operate in that particular operation. Scott Henry and his BASF representative, J.J. Pyle, talked with us. <laughs> Tell me about Longview, and especially your slogan, your approach uh, yeah. at Longview. So Longview Farms is a fourth generation family farm headquartered in, in Nevada, Iowa. Uh, we've, we've been farming as a family uh, for over 60 years now uh, at this location. My great grandfather, uh, Kenneth Long, started the operation in this location in 1955. Our slogan or our mantra is honor the past, steward the present and look to the future and really trying to bring the legacy and heritage elements of what farming traditionally has been but also make sure that we're looking forward and looking to be progressive in how we approach things as well as our mindset. Share with us the scope of your operation. Yeah. Over how wide a geography do you farm? So today we're operating right around 10,000 acres, all in central Iowa. And so we're predominantly in Story County, but we do touch every surrounding county a little bit. And so we've, we've really enjoyed having a close knit kind of acre base. It really helps us stay efficient as well as maintain a lot of local relationships on the supply side. So when we think about Longview Farms and what drives us every day, our view is we want to be here for the long run. And, and that requires doing right by the land, doing right by our landowners, and doing right by our business partners, and most importantly for, to our family, doing right by our team. 
And so every day driving to work, we're always thinking about how can we put this operation and its family in the best position to succeed. And BASF has helped us do that and will continue to do that, I have no doubt, in the future. Describe your relationship with JJ. How do you, how you work with <laughs> mm -hmm. that young man and uh, the exchange that takes place between the two of you? Yeah. We work very well with our BASF representative, JJ Pyle. Uh, in fact, he, he started his career working for our family. And so it's very much a relationship that's built on trust as well as uh, just a great agronomic knowledge that he has. We call him often with questions about timing, product performance and placement, nozzle type, uh, and just supply chain as well. And it's always a transparent, honest answer and a willingness to jump in a pickup, regardless if that's at 6.30 in the morning, eight o'clock at night or on a Sunday. So when we think about the advisors for our farm, our relationship with JJ Pyle, our BASF representative, is an integral part of that. Uh, for us, it really is a year-long relationship uh, and a year-long conversation that, that ultimately yields great results for our farm. We enjoy sharing those stories of the farmer BASF partnership such as we found there with Scott Henry and J.J. Pyle. You can see more at PlantSmartGrowSmart.com. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone Ag. The Firestone Ag dealer network offers you the support, inventory, and resources you need. Visit FirestoneAg.com to find your local certified dealer. And now it's time to dig into these volatile markets with Carl Setzer. He is the Commodity Risk Analyst with AgriVisor. Carl, thanks for joining us this week. Oh, thanks for having me, Mike. Appreciate it. One of the major stories this past week have been the moves in the wheat market. All classes of wheat were volatile. Carl, what was driving wheat higher to start the week? Uh, I tell you, you know, really, it's, it's a carryover from the week before, Mike. We saw the news out of India, and we've been tracking this for quite a while. It's kind of a roller coaster, and you keep seeing these 180s. Is India going to export wheat? Are they not going to export wheat? Um, India typically not a huge wheat exporter, but with the uh, shutoff of the Black Sea and not being able to get that supply out, uh, mainly Ukraine wheat, and it's trickling into the market, but nothing like we typically see out of that region. Uh, you can't take vessels into load. There's loaded vessels in there, can't move. We know that whole story. But India said all of a sudden, yeah, we're going to shut off all of our exports. And, uh, you know, that got wheat. You know, it sparked it higher, and then all of a sudden, India's like, well, no, maybe not. Maybe we will still export, but it's going to have to be to a, you know, a country that's really in need of some, some food products, and we'll honor pre-existing sales, and, and so, I mean, everything, the confusion just caused everybody to, to start walking away. That really got the market to, to start moving a little bit lower. And then, of you know, of all places, Russia comes out and says that their next year's wheat crop is going to be huge, and you know they're going to be able to supply the world with 20% of its its wheat needs. Now, the question is, is you know, and, and we're not, I'm not going to get in this, but who's going to buy wheat from Russia? Well, everybody who needs it. I mean, let's just get you know, plain and simple. That's going to happen. The thing is with wheat, though, is you know, you hear the reports out of the U.S. and all of a sudden that winter wheat crop rating started to creep a little bit higher and it you know it's still poorly rated but it's getting a little better and then you throw some precipitation in on top of it and a few rain chances and and mike you know how wheat is i mean you can a little bit of moisture goes a long ways in a wheat crop and then let's just you know we've got seasonal harvest pressure starting to build a little bit too a little bit of that crop coming out down in texas um you know, we're kind of overlooking the, the reports on the wheat crop that, you know, it's in poor shape. Um, it really, wheat just back and forth, back and forth. But at the end of the day, you got to look at where, even with big losses in wheat, where it's still trading, and it's still a pretty respectable level. On the spring wheat side, Carl, that same moisture that's helping that winter wheat crop is keeping that spring wheat out of the fields. Do you see that market moving higher in the short term? Uh, yeah, I think we get, uh, uh, you know, if, if we had to look at it, I would say spring wheat 
probably has a little bit better chance of holding the gains moving forward. And we got to remember that this, you know, the, the drought that we have, uh, you know, is, is hurting the winter crop more so than the spring crop. The spring crop, like you said, let's look in the Dakotas, um, you know, and that doesn't end at the U.S. border. That, that slow planting is going up into Canada as well. Can, Canadian planting is well behind. Uh, you know, in the U.S., we could see fewer than 10 million spring wheat acres, Mike. That is something we're definitely going to have to keep an eye on as we move forward. This wheat story, I think, is going to build for the next several weeks. I think you're right. There's a lot more to come in these markets, and we'll discuss them in detail with Carl Setzer when we return. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone Ag. Harvey Firestone invented the first pneumatic farm tire, forever changing what it means to farm hard. Visit FirestoneAg.com to learn more about this history and tire solutions for today. We're back talking markets with Carl Setzer, the Commodity Risk Manager at AgriVisor. And Carl, this corn market, we're getting close to planting for a lot of areas. We're seeing those delays begin to rack up. Where do you see corn headed from here? I tell you, Mike, corn, you know, I think we're getting a little, uh, we, we've gotten a little top heavy in the market. And when I say that, you know, $8 futures, we sit and look at that. Let's look at where we're at compared to other suppliers. And, and they're really kind of beating us up a little bit, mainly South America, Argentina putting corn out at a sharp discount to the United States. That Brazilian safrina crop, going to be a little bit bigger, I think, uh, than what trade has expected. We got some very favorable weather for ear fill down there, and it's, it's you know, adding a little bit there. I think that's going to make up for the drought losses, and I think Safrina acres on a whole have been underestimated. You look at that, and, and, and even though we have the, you know, good futures in the market, and we've been under a little pressure, I think we see a little bit more come at us, at least until we get the first initial flush of that South American corn through, see what we're going to have demand for after that. And that's, I think we just have to regroup in that corn complex a little bit. Well, as we're thinking about demand, Carl, on the soybean side, demand has been fairly strong. How have exports looked recently? Uh, really good. You know, you look in, in the, the last U.S. sales report, 27.7 million bushels old crop sold, 5.5 million bushels new crop. Um, buyers still showing up for U.S. soybeans, and you got to look at, you know, even though South American soybeans, a little bit of an edge on the U.S. in the market, you got to look at how long they're going to be able to export with that shorter crop they have and a really questionable uh, supply of palm oil in the market. Um, I think that gives the U.S. soy complex some support. One thing we got to look at, though, China has announced they will start taking canola. Uh, they lifted their ban on Canadian canola. Now, I don't think there's a lot of canola up there to be had. They had that short crop last year. Definitely a factor we're going to have to look at on that export front and see if it affects us moving forward. That is true. Carl, I want to turn our focus to the livestock markets and cattle in particular as we gear up for summer, the big grilling season of the year. What's your anticipation for live cattle prices? Uh, I tell you, I, I think that we got to get past the Memorial Day weekend, I think, Mike. I, I would not be, exp uh, I would be surprised if we didn't have huge grilling demand uh, coming at us that weekend. Uh, regardless of high prices, guys will jump out. They will buy steaks. They'll, you know, the, the first celebration. What happens after that? Um, if we have these inflationary concerns continue in the market and it looks like they're going to be around for a while, the consumer in the store, if he starts looking at, you know, $20, $25 uh, beef versus, you know, three and a half dollar pork, the, the consumer is going to dictate where that goes. Uh, we've seen a little bit of pressure in the cash market here lately, and it makes me wonder if packers are maybe saying they're showing the same apprehension that they're worried about what the consumer is going to do as we get into midsummer. Uh, if gasoline prices continue to rally, consumers cut back on, you know, what they consider to be luxury items. And unfortunately, T-bones and ribeyes fall into that. I think we still see beef demand. Um, I just got to think it backs off a little bit with that U.S. dollar and financial market where it is. A lot of uncertainty in the broad market. That's Carl Setzer from AgriVisor. Carl, thanks for joining us this week. No, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Chad Colby's look at agriculture technology comes your way next, brought to you by the IBM Watson Decision Platform. 
Combining AI with Internet of Things data to help agribusiness increase yields, improve quality, and drive sustainability. I would like to look in Chad Colby's shop sometime. There's a lot of stuff in there to be sure. He loves his power tools, and he gives us a look at one this week. Who doesn't like cordless equipment? I love my cordless chainsaw. But there might be something new here that may take the cake. As you can see, I've got a cordless string trimmer right there. And that unit allows you to have a, they have a system called Quick Lock. And basically what it allows you to do is to have different attachments that go onto that power unit. This week, I had some challenges in my yard. And I purchased from Milwaukee a 10-foot pull saw kit. And essentially all you do is you push a button, turn a knob, and in a matter of a second or two, the string trimmer comes right out, and then you put the pull saw kit right in. It's very easy to use. Once I got it together, all I needed to do was fill it up with uh, bar oil, as you can see me doing right here. And after that, we're in business. And this thing's amazing. If you haven't had the opportunity to experience the power of this, you know, it goes to full power in less than a second. You can cut up to 150 cuts per charge, which is great. It's very, very lightweight. It doesn't weigh that much. They also make an attachment as well to extend that out another three foot, which honestly, I might actually buy that. It just seems really handy. But I'll tell you what, the electronics in this is what makes it nice. But look at the job I did here. In a matter of maybe an hour, I completely removed all the trees, all the brush, everything out of my way. That was kind of bothering me when I was mowing the grass. As you can see, I've got a little bit of an arsenal, like many of us do, of cordless equipment. And the best part is it's the same battery all the way across that ecosystem, whether it's the blower, the hedge trimmer, the chainsaw, the lights, the impact guns, the vacuums, whatever it might be. Oh, and Max, just as a fair warning, I placed an order for some new stuff that's coming that just came out from Milwaukee, and I can't wait to share that. Milwaukee's a company you got to keep your eye on. There's always a lot of new innovations. Mr. Colby seemed very adept at using that saw. Maybe we could get him to our place sometime. Probably have to trade out a meal with him, by all means. We appreciate his visits each weekend here on This Week in Agribusiness. Thanks for joining us here for This Week in Agribusiness. This past week, it heated up across a lot of the Corn Belt. Max, and as I was traveling, I saw some farmers getting out there, making some progress. Saw a little bit of tillage happening in the fields, and I saw some planters running. How about you? It heated up. That's an important phrase. More ways than one. And the heat did make a difference for many producers to be able to get into fields that had been wet. Let's check in with a friend who can give us an update from East Central Illinois. Kent Casson has the Central Illinois Farm Network. He talks with farmers and others every morning there. And can't you farm also? Uh, what are you seeing around you and what kind of progress have you made there around uh, Fairbury, Illinois, between Bloomington and Chicago? Well, you guys mentioned that weather. That was something to be in the, the car heart mowing out some roads, uh, you know, the week before and switching the short sleeves and uh, quite the uh, drastic change. But we did get a lot of work done like many others. As we uh, talk right now, we're down to the final 100 acres of soybeans. May have to piece in a few more beans that were planted early, had just enough of a crust on them to kind of uh, piece in some more seeds. But for the most part, we're lucky, had a very good planting season, fairly quick. All the corn's in the ground now, and like we said, just finishing up those soybeans. You mentioned the crust. I've heard other farmers talking about that. I wondered if uh, maybe folks had gone to the back of the shed or back out toward the fence row to pull out the rotary hole. Has there been any of that around you? As Dad and I were talking, you can almost pick out the neighbors that are always going to pull out those rotary hoes each and every year to break the soil a little bit. And we didn't do that. Our core did break through, luckily. But like we said, with some of the beans, uh, the no-till ground was marginal. Uh, neighbors experiencing some of the same things. But by any means, no big uh, replants out there, just some uh, touch-ups here and there. And now we're hoping Mother Nature takes over and cooperates the rest of the season. As folks were working over this past week around you, were there still some wet spots? Were they having to avoid some holes out there? There were a couple of mud holes, even at one of our farms. Normally, uh, the long rows of a field we thought were dry. We did come across one with a corn planter. You had to bump it up a little bit not to drag through there. But uh, otherwise, uh, it had been drying off fairly well. Uh, even some of our so-called wetter farms, which aren't quite as good for soil, uh, they really 
uh, took in the moisture well and, and were dry and, uh, and worked up nicely too. Tiling has paid off. That plumbing that's gone into the fields over the past few years, and in many instances, Mike, I was exchanging messages with a good farm friend the other day. He said he wasn't going to be buying any more land right now, but he was going to be pattern tiling his fields. You know, I've heard that from several folks. They say this is how I can put some value in, really expand it quickly without adding more acres. Kent, I'm curious. We talk about that farmland price, cash rents going up, diesel is through the roof. As you talk to growers, how are they feeling? What are the attitudes you're running into in the countryside? Well, I just interviewed one local grower here, my neighbor, in fact, this week for a weekly field update in Livingston County. And uh, he says, like, like many farmers tell me, that it's just part of the game. You know, the higher inputs, uh, the higher fuel prices, you have to adjust. You have to still go out there, of course, uh, to raise the food for everybody. But uh, it's just part of uh, what being a farmer is all about. We're used to those changes, maybe not quite so drastic, but... Uh, we all know what the weather, the inputs, many of the costs uh, beyond our control, which I agree with those sentiments. Yeah, that's pretty common out there in farm country. Kent, as we're moving into planting, we're finally seeing some planters start to roll. It is a little bit delayed, and there's been some concerns that growers might be shifting acres. As you talk to your neighbors there in central Illinois, are you hearing folks move from corn to soybeans this late in the game, or are most folks sticking with their plan? I think for the most part around here, most are sticking to their original plans. We do have more and more growers every year uh, starting soybeans first, as we're hearing that they need to capture more of the sunlight, uh, more of the growing degree units to really yield better in the in the fall. So we're seeing a lot of beans going the ground first, and then the corn. But those guys with two planters on the operation, like we have now, we're really starting at the same time to get a lot done in a in a short window, and uh, that's kind of the way it's going here these days. That is good to hear. We've seen so many folks make those investments to modernize and improve their ability to get the seed in the ground. Kent, I want to ask, you're going to get the crops in. We're going to have hopefully a good summer, see everything grow. Then we've got to sell them. Looking around at your local markets, how's it holding up? Are you seeing bids stay strong? Yeah, it appears bids are staying strong in our local uh, cooperative. That's the case. We mainly uh, deal with one elevator where we're at, but uh, yeah, several of the others are, are similar situations. I kind of monitor those cash grain bids we report on daily on the on the morning show, and all pretty similar, but still hanging in there. And uh, you know, a little bit of a of a correction, I guess, this week and last week too. But uh, understandable with all the pressure out there for planting progress. Yes, indeed, Kent. Of course, next week will be here before we know it. What's the weather looking like in your part of the world this next week? You think farmers are going to be able to keep running? I think it looks like we'll get some rain and maybe a rain delay. I don't know quite as big as it was here two and a half weeks ago, but some of the outlooks do call for upwards of an inch to, dare I say, two inches of rain. But uh, at this point, an older farmer tells me we could stand to use a half inch or three quarters to uh, kind of get on top of these newly planted crops. That is the key. There's always a lot of things going on in the world of agriculture. Certainly no exception in central Illinois. Our thanks, Kent Casson, Central Illinois Farm Network. Appreciate you taking the time to join us today or, or this week, rather, Max. There's a lot happening in ag. He's in an important part of the Corn Belt there. The buckle of the Corn Belt, I guess, is uh, not far from him. Uh, Iroquois County, Illinois, refers to itself that way. A lot of great corn and soybean production right in that heart of Illinois region there. You know, it was interesting talking about a break with rain. One farmer told me the other day he had been running so hard on their operation, they needed a caution flag on the track, as he put it, because they needed some rest. It gets busy at planting time. There's more coming up here on this weekend's edition of This Week in Agribusiness, including Greg Solier's all-important agriculture weather forecast. Stay with us. This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Case IH. Welcome back, folks, and thanks for joining us for This Week in Agribusiness. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, Max. Certainly an important conversation at planting time. I know you've been learning a lot about mental health. We have. We've been consulted each week by Adrienne DeSutter. She's on the farm in Illinois, and she talks with farm families quite a bit about some of their challenges they are working through. There are young people on the farm, too. They are very busy, as we see in the social media posts, their FFA, 4-H activities, and there are some challenges there as well. Oh, for sure, Max. Um, you're right, and some of it is just that, is juggling all the different organizations and all the things that are going on with farm families. 
you know, we're not just uh, we're not just attending school. We're attending 4-H and trying to balance some of what we're doing out of school with with the pressures that are happening at school. Um, you know, th there's a, the scheduling. There's still practices and sports and things like that that they're trying to be involved in, in addition to showing your livestock or helping out on the farm during, you know, especially during those busy seasons or getting chores done. So there's definitely a lot going on at all ages. You know, my children, uh, my oldest is only five. We've got four kids, five and under. And so, you know, we definitely see some of the stresses um, during planting and harvest especially. Um, but even the transition into the busy seasons or the transition out of the busy seasons of how our routine gets broken up at home and changing changes so much at home when that's a time where routine is really crucial for, for young children too. So um, yeah, kids at all ages definitely are struggling sometimes, um, you know, in addition to experiencing the wonderful parts of being on a farm family. Especially teens, it seems to me, and as a father of daughters and a father of granddaughters, it seems like young ladies go through quite a load in those teenage years. And, and you hear of parents who are really trying to get their arms around this challenge, and, and it becomes a scary time for many. Uh, you know, I will tell you that I was a teenage girl once, <laughs> and so I can completely relate. Um, I also counseled in the school that I worked with was 6th grade through 12th grade, so I am right there with you that those middle school years into, into high school can be a, a, a real struggle. Um, and I think one of the things we have to focus on as parents or, you know, grandparents or, or as adults is, is being able to connect with teens. Um, I think the CDC came out with a statistic recently that 44% of teens felt persistently sad or hopeless during this pandemic recently. That's a whole lot, you know, feeling persistently sad or hopeless. Those are symptoms of, of medical health conditions, mental health conditions like depression or anxiety. And um, so, so that's a big number. And we need to make sure that we're focusing on connectedness, um, whether that is getting teens feeling connected to school, connected to those 4-H, church, other organizations, or just feeling connected to us as parents or, or um, with teachers or some other adult. A lot of times we try to go right for that problem solving, you know, how can I help you or what can I do or what type of advice can I give or conversations can I have? Sometimes the best thing we can do as adults is take a step back, really think about what it was like to be a teenager, use that empathy, and then just listen, allow your teens to, to, to talk in whatever way, wherever they're comfortable. Just take a step back and listen and really observe what it is that's going on through their lives and what they're struggling with. And sometimes professional help is needed, isn't it? Uh, it, it can make a, all the difference of night and day. Absolutely. I've heard so many stories, just countless stories of teenagers and, and, and people at all ages, of course, that have talked to a doctor about um, you know, seeing a therapist. It can just be a resource at school, like a school counselor or a social worker at school, or even going that step beyond and, and seeing someone. Um, you can work with your health insurance to figure out what type of providers are covered, but most insurance does cover mental health um, treatments like conversations with a therapist. Um, and you don't have to have a depression or anxiety diagnosis. You can, anyone can see a therapist. Anyone can benefit from a therapist um, or a counselor. And so, so, yes, those conversations can just help us have sort of a mediator um, that helps us understand better what's going on in, in our children's minds and help us relate better. We sure do appreciate the insight that Adrian shares with us here in the month of May each year. There is that website you can consult yourself, and there's a lot of great information. You can go state by state to get some help there. It's farmstateofmind.org. Greg Solier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead, presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. Now about those temperature extremes all over the place. If you were to plot it on the map, it's like that. Let's see if Greg has any relief for us here. Uh, we continue back and forth and quite a phenomenal range of temperatures across the North American continent. We've had these uh, prods of cool to cold air and over the past weekend, frost and freeze into parts of the Dakotas. Early on into the week, it's still a progression of weather systems into the Pacific Northwest. Drought improvement cascades on westward. Uh, 
nibbling away at it in some locales as you get uh, to the east. And again, these wide ranging temperatures and once again, one of these colder weather systems up aloft has a little snow mixed into the higher uh, elevations of the northern and central Rockies and down towards the Black Hills. More seasonal temperatures into the northern valleys of California. Farther south, plenty of heat uh, into the southwestern sections of the country. Another push of cooler air here. Another couple of uh, ripples in the jet stream current. We spin up new low pressure and a couple of more active thunderstorms making their way across parts of the Dakotas, uh, the Red River Valley, the north. And we do not need any more rain in this particular corridor as the flooding continues on and east and south coming off recent uh, activity. Another system ashore into the Pacific Northwest later on into the week. And this time of the year, yeah, easily 95 to 105 degree heat into the southern valleys of California, desert southwest as well. We've seen some of that on a recurring basis and a couple of thunderstorms that get going into the parched areas, the central and southern high plains. You get those downpours. You don't get much percolation to the soils. So again, the issues continue on here as well as uh, the heat in the southwestern states begins to build back in the four corners. A slight cool off for the valleys of California. No moisture. And by the way, Lake Mead, the lowest it's been since 1937. Here are a couple of severe storms back across parts of the plains and another push of hot weather into those drought areas of the plains too. You know, in the northern plains and in the prairie provinces of Canada, we've seen some social media pictures of some field work happening, some seeding, planting taking place there, but they still have a ways to go. Uh, that's right. And of course, uh, each time we get these pushes of cool to cold air, the heat begins to work to the north. We get these converging air masses here, clockwise flow off the cold highs, southerly winds along the warm front. You get the clusters of showers and thunderstorms. Yeah, some snowflakes into the Black Hills, windy, milder weather early in the week into the western Great Lakes region, but another run of moisture into the western Corn Belt, including some of the wet areas, and that will expand back into areas of the upper Midwest, head into the uh, Dakotas, Big Sky Country with a second system middle to late portions of the week, and the propensity for severe weather mid-Missouri Valley on south and eastward. Some opportunity uh, for some field work into the eastern Corn Belt, but those uh, cooler air masses will begin to bring down soil temperatures that were up a few degrees coming off the warmth last week. Plenty of warmth and heat across the southern and central plains and more severe storm clusters on this warm front as cooler air moves into the Tennessee Valley. More seasonal temperatures and maybe a dry base thunderstorm into New Mexico. Not much opportunity to uh, squelch the fire situation into the southwestern sections of the country. We'll probably aggravate it with some of these dry thunderstorm outbreaks in that part of the uh, plains. More severe weather potential scattered across the central and southern plains and again warmth beginning to move back into the Tennessee Valley the mid to late portions of the week. In the eastern part of the country, it looks like spring. Will it feel like it this week? At, at times, otherwise it is still up and down on temperatures and even a few snowflakes behind the next windy weather system across uh, the northern sections of New England. Quiet high pressure across the eastern and northern Corn Belt locales. Note the warm front and the low over the western complex. And once again, showers and thunderstorms get going here. Heavy and severe Mississippi Valley on westward. Still some opportunity late in the week for uh, to advance field work in the eastern Corn Belt back into cool dry weather into the northeast and New England. Southeastern states we go and again cooler drier air coming off maybe some triple digit readings that we have seen uh, over the late portion of last week with some heat and humidity Gulf Coast areas along with additional scattered showers and thunderstorms into Georgia. Hardly any rain here for the month of May. More storm activity heavy and severe back west of the Mississippi late in the week. Greg Sonia is back with his extended farm weather forecast for the country presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. We get a good look at Greg Solier's forecast for the next few weeks now. But in this week ahead, let's see what's uh, on his precipitation map here. Oh my goodness, some heavy stuff at the southeast, it appears. That's right, back up into the Ohio Valley Eastern Corn Belt later in the coming week, and we'll get additional moisture, albeit much lighter in fashion. Still some soft and muddy grounds. We've kind of uh, changed around the whole uh, atmospheric setup where we had delays early in the planting season in this particular part, and we're back into play as the week wears on, and perhaps some opportunity uh, for at least a little bit of work early in the week over the northwestern and western Corn Belt. Note the, still the snow potential up towards Hudson Bay, James Bay, north of the St. Lawrence, back through Big Sky Country, the Black Hills, sections of the northern and central Rockies, some isolated moisture amounts, uh, northern California, the Pacific Northwest, but this is the meat and potatoes of it all. Ohio Valley, southeastern states and the southeastern plains, heavy and severe, the operative weather words. Does the pendulum swing then for that week after Memorial Day? Will we warm up? Uh, for temperatures, yeah, and look at the expansion 
advance of the hot ridge, uh, the hot dome. It's been back and forth, back and forth. And that's the story here for much of the remainder of the spring and early season, uh, early summer season. No sign of La Nina, by the way, breaking down until late summer or early autumn. So I think no shortage of weather systems as we get deeper into summertime as well. Here's the cool to cold air, Canadian Prairie, Pacific Northwest, the heat from the Corn Belt, east and south from there, and the precipitation pattern along that boundary, that discontinuity is active. Pacific Northwest, Northern Plains, maybe some additional flooding issues here, and look at the propensity for severe weather, much of the central and southern Corn Belt as we begin the new month of June. Time out. You said no shortage of weather systems. Does that mean there'll be good moisture through the growing season? Probably so. At the same time, maybe some field work and planning delays. So that is the trade-off around here. We do, we do not see any concern over dryness and drought here, and probably not until very late in the summer season or early autumn for even the western Corn Belt. Yeah, there will be some additional drought relief in this particular corridor. Here is the fragmented hot ridge over the southwest and the southeastern parts of the country. And again, a propensity for weather systems to make their move along that boundary. Again, more significant moisture for much of the Corn Belt back through the southern Canadian prairie. How's your old hot ridge look for that week of June 13th? Well, will the warmth be that week? As we get ready to approach uh, astronomical summertime, boy, this is a hot weather pattern. Maybe some triple digit stuff in the parts of the southern Corn Belt, southern plains. Note the cooler around the move and a couple of dips in the jet stream here and here. And we continue to move weather systems right along drought relief into the Pacific Northwest and an active weather pattern across much of the Corn Belt through mid-June. Next on This Week in Agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed, spotlighting another great American tractor. Well, if you're still using that tractor, you plan to continue using it. Do you want to fix it up too well? Let's talk about that in Max's Tractor Shed this weekend. Brought to you by Store Lock Tool Cabinets. Go to their website. Look at all they have to offer. Get their phone number on the website. Call them up and tell them about your needs. The website is storelock.com. When you're fixing up a tractor, as many of you know so well, there are various levels of restoration. You can get it parade ready. You can have it ready for the shows. You can impeccably restore it. Of course, cost is one determinant, and another is your intended use. If you're going to take it back into the field, you don't want to fix it up too much. Well, this tractor is at Redding, Michigan, and Tamara Snodgrass was telling me about it. She and her husband have this International 404. It was owned by her dad. Her husband bought the tractor when her dad passed away, and she said they're fixing it up. They've replaced the hydraulic pump. They're replacing the water pump, getting it ready for service. Rhonda commented, She's not pretty, but she's a good little tractor. She'll be raking hay in no time. That International 404 that came out of the plant at Louisville, Kentucky, 60 years ago, soon to be back out in the field at Reading, Michigan. Well, Max, this upcoming week, we've got several really nice retirement sales and a couple estate auctions. Stephen McCaslin is retiring from Yuma, Colorado. Their sale features a 2012 New Holland CR8090 combine with 1,182 separator hours. The Thomas H. Ross Estate in Halstead, Kansas, features a 1971 John Deere 4320. Gale C. Johnson Estate in Ong, Nebraska will sell a 2013 John Deere 4720 mechanical front tractor with a loader. This machine only has 105 hours. Plus, we have a special sale next week on Thursday, May the 26th, for Heil Harvesting. Heil Harvesting started in 1974, and due to the unfortunate accident and the death of Brad Heil, they'll be selling their quality items, a 2016-6140 Case IH Combine and a 7088 Combine. They've got a John Deere 8120 mechanical front tractor. There's a Keystone 31-foot bunkhouse trailer. They have Kinsey grain carts, and they have a Diamond Combine tractor and grain cart trailer, plus a lot of other good quality equipment to support the family on their special day, May 26th. All this equipment selling on BigIron.com next week. Now it's time to meet one of those FFAers from across the country, and this week we're meeting Vicki Ferentz. She has just completed her term as the state vice president for the Nebraska FFA. Vicki, thanks for joining us, and what were some of the highlights during your year of service? So some of our highlights were definitely being in person. We didn't know what this year kind of had um, 
ahead of us. So when we got to see people at chapter officer leadership training, edge conference, which is learning about personal development, actually being in their schools and teaching classes. And then lastly, state convention, huge, big, and um, our theme was empower. It was amazing to empower the students and be empowered by them. So it was just an amazing year with all of these students around Nebraska. Vicki, the energy level at convention this year, was it just really high? Oh my goodness, I had chills every time they started the music and you could just see the students just wanted to be there and the smiles on their faces, like they were so true. And then the award ceremony, everyone was so hyped. And so it was such a good um, experience to be, um, I was in the student position and now being a state officer and seeing their happiness was crazy. Vicki, when you think back to being in that student position, what was it about FFA that made you want to join? So my dad and my brother um, were actually my ag advisors. So I had a whole different aspect of FFA. I started when I was literally two and I've never missed a state convention. So don't worry, I even watched the virtual ones. But through my years, I just found my place. And when they say you find your place in agriculture and FFA, it's just, it's the best industry to be in. So um, I kind of found my home and what I want to do in my future with it. That's fantastic. And in the future, you're planning to stay in the agriculture industry, a student at UNL studying agribusiness with the Realtor Option. Vicki, we wish you the best. Thank you so much. There's a lot of folks looking at the equipment on their farm, looking at their ground and wondering, Max, what is it worth? Prices have been volatile for the past year, and it looks like that's going to continue. Yeah, we get a good summary each week from Mark Stock at Big Iron Auctions about what's getting ready to move across their block. But Mark joins us this weekend. We need to ask you, uh, what has uh, the price been on some of these things? What are you seeing? Well, we're seeing a steady uh, climb in the real estate market. There's just not a lot of land hitting the market. And that stuff that does hit the market usually has a dozen or more different people that are bidding and uh, working to buy this property. And it's very interesting, too, uh, Max and Mike, that the majority of the transactions, when they close, they're coming to the table with cash. They're not financing any of the purchase price. So. Uh, that's very interesting. We're seeing a good solid 20 to 30 percent increase uh, just a year over year in some of the good quality farmland. And uh, we expect that to continue because we're seeing, you know, really good commodity prices. You had eight dollar old crop opportunities and new crop opportunities for seven dollar plus and uh, people are still looking to add land to their portfolios. Mark, as planting season gets underway, are you still seeing that surge in acres come on the market or do you anticipate it backing off a little bit? We see a little bit of slowdown during that planting season, but we have noticed that we're getting a little uh, earlier in the fall sale cycle. In fact, we've got quite a few land auctions scheduled now for the last part of July and into August and September. We've already got a lot of folks that have reached out to us to get their land uh, scheduled to sell in November with a December closing. Uh, so that has picked up. There's quite a few more calls uh, than we normally see this time of year. Geography. Mark, where is the land market the hottest? Is it the heart of the Corn Belt? It is. Uh, the heart of the Corn Belt is bringing phenomenal money, but we're still seeing, unfortunately, some of the top selling prices are property that's within one or two miles of some of these urban development areas. Uh, we just sold some property in Nebraska close to Lincoln for over $60,000 an acre. But in 10 years, that's all going to be residential property. So we see some of those high prices that are obviously influencing and picking up the average. But uh, we're still seeing uh, anywhere where you got good quality premium soils bringing phenomenal money. They're fighting for it. And as I just said, they're coming in with cash. And it's not always just residential. I mean, these, the sprawl of these massive warehouses is quite obvious around big cities, too, isn't it? Yes, it is. And uh, we've got a, a, a part of our company, they just focus on helping some of those uh, farmers sell that property to make sure that they do uh, achieve the price that can be obtained when you have some of those big businesses coming into town. Because uh, once you take it out of that, uh, once you take it out of production, uh, you know, you're losing a lot of that uh, opportunity, but the opportunity there is location, 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 yeah, right. uh, when you are fortunate enough to have something close to a town that's actually growing. Finally, you're allowing people to share their stories from agriculture and rural communities. 
Uh, yes, we are. Big Iron is proud to be sponsoring a web channel called Share Your Legacy. And uh, with this uh, project, folks, we are interviewing families, uh, individuals across America that have impacted their community or their family in some way, shape, or form. In fact, one story you'll see is a, is a gentleman that had been on the volunteer fire department for over 52 years wow. and how he has saved countless lives and how him and his family, now his son and his grandson are also members of that volunteer fire department. So we have stories like that that will be on the ShareYourLegacy.com site and on our YouTube channel. And uh, we're reaching out to people too that may know of somebody, maybe your uncle, your aunt, or your grandfather uh, has done something that impacted everybody in your community. So reach out to ShareYourLegacy.com and send us those submissions. Mark Stock, Big Iron Auctions. I look forward to looking at that site as they build it out of the weeks ahead. ShareYourLegacy.com. Get those stories out there. We'll see you next week here. Yes, sir. We look forward to your joining us here on This Week in Agribusiness. We hope you work safely in the field. Be careful. Have a great week. So long, everyone. Closed captioning for This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Kubota. Shape your world. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by OMAX Communication in association with 22 Creative Group. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.